Good evening. Welcome to Readings in Isolation. My name is Saman Gerard. Hi, thank you for the hearts. And I'll be reading for you from A Thousand and One Nights, as usual, as we've been doing for approximately six months now. Um, this is going to be a long reading. Mind you, get comfortable, please. Oops. All right. I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful day. I did. All right, we're at, where are we? The 144th night. All right, enjoy the reading. Now, when it was the 144th night, she said, it had reached me, auspicious king, that the two kings agreed each to rule one day in turn. Then made they feasts and offered sacrifices of clean beasts and held high fes festivals. And they abode thus a while while Sultan Kanmakan spent his nights with his cousin Kuzia Fakan. And after that period, as the two kings sat rejoicing in their condition and in the happy ending of their troubles, behold, they saw a cloud of dust arise and tower till it wore the world from their eyes. And out of it came a merchant shrieking and crying aloud for succour and saying, O kings of the age, how cometh it that I want safely in the land of the infidels and I am plundered in your realm, though it be the biding place of justice and peace? Then King Rumzan went up to him and questioned him of his case, and he replied, I am a merchant, and like other merchants, I have been long absent from my native land, traveling in far countries for some twenty years, and I have a patent of exemption from the city of Damascus, which the viceroy, King Shah Khan, who hath found mercy, wrote me, for the cause that I had made him gift of a slave girl. Now as I was drawing near my home, having with me an hundred loads of rarities of Hind, when I brought them near Baghdad, which be the seat of your sovereignty and the place of your peace and your justice, out there came upon me wild Arabs and Kurds in band gathered together from every land. And they slew my many and they robbed my money and this is what they have done to me. Then the trader wept in presence of King Rumzan, saying that he was an old man and infirm, and he bemoaned himself till the king felt for him and had compassion on him. And likewise did King Kanmakan, and they swore that they would sally forth upon the thieves. So they set out amid an hundred horse, each reckoned worth thousands of men, and the merchant went before them to guide them in the right way. And they ceased not faring on all that day and the live long night till dawn break. When they came to a valley abounding in rills and shady with trees. Here they found the foray dispersed about the valley, having divided that merchant's bales among them. But there was yet some of the goods left. So the hundred horsemen fell upon them and surrounded them on all sides. And King Rumzan shouted his war cry. And thus also did his nephew Kanmakan. And ere long they made prize of them all to the number of near three hundred horsemen banded together of the refuse of rascality. They took what they could find of the merchant's goods and binding them tightly, brought them to Baghdad, where King Rumzan and his nephew, King Kanmakan, sat down together on one throne and passing the prisoners in review before them, questioned them of their case and their chiefs. They said, we have no chiefs but these three men and it was they who gathered us together from all corners and countries. The king said to them, point out Point out to us your headmen. And when this was done, they bade lay hands on the leaders and set their comrades free, 
after taking from them all the goods in their possession and restoring them to the merchant who examined his stuffs and monies and found that a fourth of his stock was missing. The kings engaged to make good the haul of his loss, whereupon the trader pulled out two letters, one in the handwriting of Shah Khan and the other in that of Nuzat al-Zaman. For this was the very merchant who had bought Nuzat al-Zaman of the Badawi when she was a virgin and had forwarded her to her brother Shah Khan. And that happened between them, which happened. Hereupon, King Kanmakan examined the letters and recognized the handwriting of his uncle Shah Khan. And having heard the history of his aunt, Nuzat al-Zaman, he went in to her with a second letter written by her to the merchant who had lost to her his monies. Kanmakan also told her what had befallen the trader from first to last. She knew her own handwriting and recognizing the merchant dispatched to him guest gifts and commended him to her brother and nephew who ordered him largesse of money and slaves and pages to wait on him. Besides which, Nuzat al-Zaman sent him a hundred thousand dirhams in cash and fifty loads of merchandise and presented to him other rich presents. Then she sent for him, and when he came, she went up to him and saluted him and told him that she was the daughter of King Omar bin al-Numan and that her brother was King Rumzan, and that King Kanmakan was her nephew. Thereupon the merchant rejoiced with great joy and congratulated her on her safety and on her reunion with her brother, and kissed her hands, thanking her for her bounty, and said to her, By Allah, a good deed is not lost upon thee. Then she withdrew to her own apartment, and the trader sojourned with them three days, after which he took leave of them and set out on his return march to the land of Syria. Thereupon the two kings sent for the three robber chiefs who were of the highwaymen and questioned them of their case, when one of them came forward and said, Know ye that I am a Badawi who am wont to lie in wait by the way, to snatch small children and virgin girls and sell them to merchants. And this I did for many a year until these latter days when Satan incited me to join yon two gallow birds in gathering together all the riffraff of the Arabs and other peoples, that we might plunder merchandise and waylay merchants. Said the kings, Tell us the rarest of the adventures that have befallen thee in kidnapping children and maidens. Replied he, O kings of the age, the strangest thing that happened to me was that one day, two and twenty years ago, I snatched a girl who belonged to the holy city. She was gifted with beauty and comeliness, despite that she was but a servant and was clad in threadbare clothes with a piece of camlet cloth on her head. So I entrapped her by guile and she came out of the caravanserai and at a, that very hour mounting her on a camel made off with her, thinking to carry her to my own people in the desert and there set her to pasture the camels and gather the droppings in the valley. But she wept with so sore a weeping, that after coming down upon her with blows, I took her and carried her to Damascus city, where a merchant saw her with me, and being astounded at her beauty and marvelling at her accomplishments, wished to buy her for me, and kept on bidding more and more for her, till at last I sold her to him for an hundred thousand dirhams. After selling her, I heard her display prodigious eloquence, and it reached me that the merchant clothed her in handsome gear and presented her to the viceroy of Damascus, who gave him three times the price which he had paid to me, and this price by my life was but little for such a damsel. This, O kings of the age, is the strangest thing that ever befell me. 
When the two kings heard her story, they wondered thereat. But when Uzat al Zaman heard what the Badawi related, the light became darkness before her face. And she cried out and said to her brother Humzan, Sure and sons thou, this is the very Badawi who kidnapped me in the holy city Jerusalem. And she told them all that she had endured from him in her strangerhood of hardship, blows, hunger, humiliation, contempt, adding, and now it is lawful for me to slay him. So saying, she seized the sword and made at him to smite him, and behold, he cried out and said, O kings of the age, suffer her not to slay me, till I shall have told you the rare adventures that have betided me. And her nephew Kamakan said to her, O my aunt, let him tell us his tale, and after that do with him as thou wilt. So she held her hand, and the king said to him, Now let us hear thy history. Quoth he, O kings of the age, if I tell you a rare tale, will ye pardon me? Yes, answered they. Then the Badawi robber chief began. The tale of Hamad the Badawi. And he said, Know ye that a short while ago I was sore wakeful one night and thought the morn would never dawn. So as soon as it was break of day, I rose without stay or delay and slinging over my shoulder my sword, mounted horse and set my lance in rest. Then I rode out to sport and hunt, and as I went along, a company of men accosted me and asked me whither I was bound. I told them, and they said, we will keep thee company. So we all fared on together, and whilst we were faring, lo and behold, up started an ostrich, and we gave her chase. But she escaped our pursuit, and spreading wings ceased not to fly before us and we following by sight, till she lost us in a desert, wherein there was neither grass nor water, nor heard we aught therein save hiss of snake, and wail of jinn and howl of ghoul. And when we reached that place, the ostrich disappeared, nor could we tell whether she had flown up into the sky, or into the ground had gone down. Then we turned our horses' heads and thought to return, but found that to retrace our steps at that time of burning heat would be toilsome and dangerous, for the sultry air was grievous to us, so that we thirsted with sore thirst, and our steeds stood still. We made sure of death, but while we were in this case, we suddenly espied from afar a spacious net where gazelles were frisking, Therein was a tent pitched, and by the tent, side a horse, tethered, and a spear was planted with head glittering in the sun. Upon this, our hearts revived after we had despaired, and we turned our horses' heads towards that tent, making for the meadow and the water which irrigated it. And all my comrades fared forward, and I at their head, and we ceased not faring till we reached the med. Then we alighted at the spring and watered our beast, but I was seized with a fever of foolish curiosity and went up to the door of that tent, wherein I saw a young man without hair on his cheeks, who fell of the new moon, and on his right hand was a slender wasted maid, as she were a willow wand. No sooner did I set eyes on her than love got hold upon my heart, and I saluted the youth who returned my greeting. Then said I, O oh my brother, tell me who thou art, and what to thee is this damsel sitting by thy side? Thereupon the youth bent his head groundwards a while, then raised it and replied, Tell me first who thou art, and what are these horsemen with thee? Answered I, I am Hamad, son of Al-Fazari, the renowned knight, who is reckoned among the Arabs as five hundred horse. 
We went forth from our place this morning to sport and chase, and were overcome by thirst. So I came to the door of this tent, thinking happily to get of thee a draught of water. When he heard these my words, he turned to the fair maiden and said, Bring this man water, and what food there is ready. So she arose, trailing her skirts, whilst the golden bangles tinkled on her ankles, and her feet stumbled in her long locks, and she disappeared for a little while. Presently she returned, bearing in her right hand a silver vessel full of cold water, and in her left hand a bowl brimming with milk and dates, together with some flesh of wild cattle. But I could take of her nor meat nor drink for the excess of my passion, and I applied to her these two couplets, saying, It was as though the sable's thigh upon her palms were raven perching on a sway of freshest snow. Thou seest sun and moon conjoined in her face, while sun fear dims and moon bright pallid show. After I had eaten and drunk, I said to the youth, Know thou, O chief of the Arabs, that I have told thee in all truth who and what I am. And now I would fain have thee do the like by me, and tell me the truth of thy case. Replied the young man, As for this damsel, she is my sister. Quoth I, It is my desire that thou give me her to wife of thy free will, else will I slay thee and take her by force. Upon this, he bowed his head groundwards a while, then he raised his eyes to me and answered, Thou seest sooth in avouching thyself a renowned knight, and famed in fight, and verily thou art the lion of the desert. But if ye all attack me, treacherously, and slay me in your wrath, and take my sister by force, it will be a stain upon your honour. And you be, as ye ever, cavaliers who are counted among the champions, and wreck not the shock of foray and fray. Give me a little time, to don my armour, and sling on my sword, and set lance in rest, and mount war steed. Then we will go forth into the field of fight, I and you, and if I conquer you, I will kill you to the last man. But if you overcome me and slay me, this damsel, my sister, is yours. Hearing such words, I replied, This is only just, and we oppose it not. Then I turned back, then I turned back my horse's head, for my love for the damsel waxed hotter and hotter and returned to my companions, to whom I set forth her beauty and loveliness, as also the comeliness of the young man who was with her, together with his valour and strength of soul, and how he had avouched himself a match for a thousand horse. Moreover, I described to my company the tent, and all the riches and rarities therein, and said to them, Know ye that this youth would not have cut himself off from society, and have taken up his abode alone in this place, were he not a man of great prowess. So I propose that whoso slayeth the younger shall take his sister. And they said, This contenteth us. Then my company armed themselves, and mounting, rode to the tent, where we found that the young man had donned his gear and backed his steed. But his sister ran up to him, her veil being drenched with tears, and took hold of his stirrup and cried out, saying, Alas, and woe worth the day, in her fear for her brother, and recited these couplets. <clears throat> to Allah will I make my moan of travail and of woe, Maybe Ilah of Arsh will smite the faces with affright. Fain would they slay thee, brother mine, with purpose fell and fell. Oh, no cause of vengeance was, nor fault for went the fight. Yet for a rider art thou known to those who back the steed, and twixt the east and west of nights thou art the proudest knight. 
Thy sister's honour thou shalt guard, though little might be hers. For thou art her brother, and for thee she sueth Allah's might. Then let not enemy possess my soul, nor thrall my frame, and work on me their will, and treat thy sister with despite. I'll never abide by a last truth in any land or home, where thou art not, though died it be, with joyance and delight. For love and yearning after thee, myself I fain will slay, and in the gloomy darksome tomb, spread bed upon the clay. But when her brother heard her verse, he wept with sore weeping, and turned his horse's head towards his sister, and made this answer to her poetry. Stand by and see the daring do, which I today will show. When meet we and I deal them blows that rend and cleave and split. Even though rush out to seek about the line of the war, the stoutest hearted brave of all, and eke the best in bed. To him I'll deal without delay a Salabian blow, and die my cane spears joined in blood by wound of foe bespit. If all I bid not off from thee, O sister, may this frame be slain and cast my corpse to bear, for so it would befit. Yes, for thy dearest sake I'll strike my blows with might and main, and when we're gone shall this event in many a book be writ. And when he, when he had ended his verse, he said, O oh, my sister, give ear to that I shall enjoin on thee. Whereto she replied, hearkening in obedience. Quoth he, If I fall, let none possess thy person. And thereupon she buffeted her face and said, Allah forbid, O oh my brother, that I should see thee lay low and yield myself to thy foe. With this, the youth put out his hand to her and withdrew her veil from her face whereupon it shone forth as the sun shineth out from the white clouds. Then he kissed her between the eyes and bade her farewell, after which he turned to us and said, Holla nice, come ye as guests or crave cuts and thrusts. If ye come to us as your hosts, rejoice ye in the guest right. And if ye covet the shining moon, come ye out against me, night by night into this plain and place of fight. Thereupon rushed out to him a doughty rider, and the young man said to him, Tell me thy name and thy father's name, for I am under an oath not to slay any whose name tallies with mine, and whose father's name is that of my father. And if this be the case with thee, I will give thee up the maid. Quoth the horseman, My name is Bilal. And the young man answered him, saying, Thou liest when speaking of benefits, while thou comest to front with thine evilest will, and of prowess thou art proud to my words give ear. I am he who makes champions in battlefield real, with keen blade like the horn of the cuspid moon, so where thrust that shall drill through the dewest hill. Then they charged down, each at each, and the youth thrust his adversary in the breast, so that the lance head issued from his back. With this another came out, and the youth cried, Ho thou hound, who art rotten with foulness and grain? What high meed is there easy for warrior to gain? Tis none save the line of strain, purest pure, who uncareth for life in the battle plain. Nor was it long before the youth left him drowned in his blood and cried out, Who will come forth to me? So a third horseman rushed upon the youth and began saying, To thee come I forth with my heart aflame, and summon my friends and my comrades by name. When thou slewest the chief of the Arabs this day, this day thou remainest the pledge of my claim. Now when the youth heard this, he answered him in these words, Thou liest, O foulest of Satans that are, and with leasings calumnious thou comest to war. This day thou shalt fall by a death-dealing point, where the lances lunge and the scimitars jar. 
Then he so foined him in the breast that the spear point issued from his back and he cried out saying, Ho, will none come out? So a fourth fared forwards, and the youth asked him his name, and he answered, My name is Hilal, the new moon. And the youth began repeating, Thou hast failed who would sink me in ruined sea, Thou who camest in malice with perfidy. I whose verses hast heard from the mouth of me will ravish thy soul, though unknown to thee. Then they drave at each other, and delivered two cuts, but the youth's stroke devanced that of the rider, his adversary, and slew him, and thus he went on to kill all who sallied out against him. Now when I saw my comrade slain, I said to myself, if I go down to fight with him, I shall not be able to prevail against him, and if I flee, I shall become a byword of shame among the Arabs. But the youth gave him no time to think, for he ran at me and dragged me from my saddle and hurled me to the ground. I fainted at the fall and he raised his sword designing to cut off my head, but I clung to his skirt and he lifted me in his hand as though I were a sparrow. When the maiden saw this, she rejoiced in her brother's prowess and coming up to him, kissed him between the eyes. Then he delivered me to her saying, take him and look to him and entreat him in hospitality, for he is come under our rule. So she took hold of the collar of my hauberk, and led me away by it, as one would lead a dog. Then she did off her brother's coat of mail, and clad him in a robe, and set for him a stool of ivory, on which he sat down, and she said to him, Allah whiten thy honour, and prevent from thee the shifts of fortune. And he answered her with these couplets. My sister said, as saw she how I stood, in fight when sun rays lit my knightlihood. Allah assain thee for a brave of braves, to whom in vale bow lions how so would. Quoth I, go ask the champion of my case, when feared the lords of war my warrior moved. My name is fame for fortune and for force, and soared my spirit to such altitude. O thou, Hamad, a lion hast upsteered, shall show thee speedy death like viper bird. Now when I heard his verse, I was perplexed as to my case, and considering my condition and how I was become a captive, I was lowered in my own esteem. Then I looked at the damsel, his sister, and seeing her beauty, I said to myself, "'Tis she who caused all this trouble. And I fell a marvelling at her loveliness till the tears streamed from my eyes and I recited these couplets. Dear friend, ah, leave thy loud reproach and blame. Such blame but irks me yet may not alarm. I'm clean distraught for one whom saw I not without her winning me by winsome charm. Yestreen her bro brother crossed me in her love a brave, stout-hearted, and right long of arm. Then the maiden set foot, food before her brother, and he bade me eat with him. Whereat I rejoiced and felt assured that I should not be slain. And when he had ended eating, she brought him a flagon of pure wine, and he applied him to it till the fumes of the drink mounted to his head and his face flushed red. Then he turned to me and said, Woe to thee, O Hamad! Dost thou know me or not? Replied I, By thy life, I am rich in naught save ignorance. Quoth he, O Hamad, I am Abad bin Tamim bin Salaba, and indeed Allah giveth thee thy liberty, and leadeth thee to a happy bride, and spareth thee confusion. Then he turned to me and said, Woe to thee, O Hamad. No, he already said that. Then he drank to my long life and gave me a cup of wine, and I drank it off. And presently he filled me a second, and a third, and a fourth, and I drained them all, while he made merry with me and swore me never to betray me. So I swear to him, 
1,500 oaths that I would never deal perfidiously with him at any time, but that I would be a friend and a helper to him. Thereupon he bade his sister bring me ten suits of silk, so she brought them and laid them on my person, and this dress I have on my body is one of them. Moreover, he made me bring one of the best of his she dromedaries, carrying stuffs and provence. He bade her also bring a sole horse, and when they were brought, he gave the whole of them to me. I abode with them three days, eating and drinking, and what he gave me of gifts is with me to this present. At the end of three days, he said to me, O oh, Hamad, O oh, my brother, I would sleep a while and take my rest, and verily I trust my life to thee. But if thou see horsemen making hither, fear not, for know that they are of the Banu Salaba, seeking to wage war on me. Then he laid his sword under his head pillow and slept. And when he was drowned in slumber, Iblis tempted me to slay him. So I arose in haste and drawing the sword from under his head, dealt him a blow that made his head fall from his body. But his sister knew what I had done, and rushing out from within the tent, threw herself on his corpse, rending her raiment and repeating these couplets. To kith and kin bear thou sad tidings of our ply, from doom Thou wise decreed, shall none of men take flight. Lo, art thou laid, O brother, strewn upon the stones, with face that mirrors moon when shining brightest bright. Good sooth, it is a day accursed, thy slaughter day, shivering thy spear that won the day in many a fight. Now thou be slain, nor rider shall delight in steed, nor man shall the breeding woman bring to light. This morn Hamad uprose and foully murdered thee, forcing his oath and troth with foulest perjury. When she had ended her verse, she said to me, O thou of accursed forefathers, wherefore didst thou play my brother false and slay him when he purposed returning thee to thy native land with provisions? And it was his intent also to marry thee to me at the first of the month. Then she drew a sword she had with her, and planting the hilt in the earth with the point set to her breast, she bent over it and threw herself thereon till she blade till the blade issued from her back, and she fell to the ground, dead. I mourned for her and wept, and repented when rep repentance availed me naught. Then I arose in haste and went to the tent, and taking whatever was light of load and weighty of worth, went my way. But in my haste and horror, I took no heed of my dead comrades, nor did I bury the maiden and the youth. And this, my tale, is still more wondrous than the story of the serving girl I kidnapped from the holy city Jerusalem. But when Nusat al-Zaman heard these words from the Badawi, the light was changed in her eyes to night. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. It's hot in here. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today is Tuesday, I guess. I think. I'm not sure. Anyways, Joanna is tuning in tomorrow and she'll be reading, so... Um, enjoy the rest of the Badawi story with her and I'll see you on Friday <laughs> thanks a lot and as usual oh, remember remember to go inwards instead of outwards thanks a lot